I was diagnosed with cancer at 29 years of age. I was a new mother and four weeks into my faculty position at the University of Miami. I had been recruited by Sylvester to develop a program in cancer disparities. I was trained as a cancer epidemiologist and planned to use statistics to describe the unequal burden of cancer in South Florida. And then I became a statistic myself and my priorities shifted. In the long evenings, when my mortality became my bedfellow, I was resigned to live a life of meaning and to ensure that my work didn't simply describe disparity, but changed it. Before my diagnosis, I had completed this mapping exercise where I was trying to understand the geographic distribution of cervical cancer across South Florida. I pick cervical cancer because it's an objective marker of health disparity. When women have ready access to routine pap smear screening and timely follow-up for detected abnormalities, they don't develop cervical cancer. And in fact, with widespread adoption of the pap smear throughout the United States, this cancer is exceedingly rare. But my mapping exercise told a different story. There was an area that lit up on my map that had an incidence of disease four times higher than anything else reported in the United States. So I was curious, was this real? Was this statistical artifact? I focused in on the area, identified the cross streets, got in my car and drove. Very quickly, I realized I was in Little Haiti given the predominance of signs in a language other than English or Spanish. To this day, I'm embarrassed that that was my first time to Little Haiti, despite being a Miami native. Here I was, recruited to this prominent institution to study disparity, and an extreme example existed less than five miles from here, right under my nose. So I came back to the School of Medicine and tried to engage my senior, my senior colleagues in dialogue about the possibility of doing meaningful research in Little Haiti. Many doors were shut in my face. I went back to Little Haiti in my new white bright lab coat, armed with my sense of purpose, and tried to engage leaders who I had identified through Google in dialogue about the possibility of collaborative science. And many doors were shut in my face. Looking back, I'm not surprised. I was the embodiment of disparity in those early days. White, privileged, affiliated with the University of Miami, and using research as my conversation starter. Unbeknownst to me, research was a dirty word in Little Haiti. During the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic, Haitian ancestry was erroneously labeled by the Centers for Disease Control as a risk factor for infection. The research that led to this action came from the University of Miami. The research itself wasn't bad, but it was manipulated in a way that led to the legitimized discrimination of a group of people already very much living on the margins. And I unwittingly inherited this institutional baggage. So I was going to have to get creative. I started showing up at community events. I became an unwanted fixture. Against my better nature, I dug deep to find the virtue of patience, and eventually, it paid off. Larry Pierre is a physician from Haiti who is the director for the Center for Haitian Studies, which is a health and social service organization located in the heart of the neighborhood that meets the emergent health and other concerns of the immigrant Haitian community in South Florida. Larry knew a lot about cervical cancer, and he wanted to talk about it with me. Three very important things happened in that initial meeting. One, we found our common humanity. I had gotten used to wearing a scarf around my neck to hide my scar from the sun and curious eyes. But the day that we met in Larry's office in early November was uncomfortably warm, so I took the, the scarf off. Larry asked me what happened, and I told him I had cancer. And in that moment, I was no longer a cold, objective, 
scientist with an agenda, I was vulnerable. I was human. And I forged a connection that has been the heart of our collaboration. Two, I learned how to listen. I might have been trained in some of the best institutions across this country, but my conversation with Larry taught me how very little I actually knew. My academic expertise didn't prepare me for the lived experience of Haitian immigrant women. And in order for me to be successful, I was going to have to marry what I knew inherently as an academic and as a scientist with Larry and other community members' local expertise so that together we could generate meaningful solutions. And last but not least, and this remains the hardest to this day, I was going to have to abandon my authority and autonomy as a scientist and invite community members, many of whom had very limited formal education, into a bi-directional dialogue where together we would come up with hypotheses and study methodologies that would lead to meaningful data collection. And that's what we've done for the past 14 years. My community members helped me understand why Haitian women were developing and dying of cervical cancer. It wasn't a story of access, which was my initial assumption. It's a complicated interplay of culture and structure and gender. And in understanding this, they challenged me to come up with hypotheses and solutions that resonated with their lived understanding of disease etiology. This work has garnered over $25 million of continual funding from the National Institutes of Health and serves as a national model how, for how academic investigators can collaborate with community partners to transcend the historical expectations of what science can and should be. And the work and the models that we have developed have fled the boundaries of Little Haiti. They inform screening protocols in Big Haiti. They've been adopted by federally qualified health centers. And they have touched unconventional communities similarly characterized by cancer disparity. Communities like our firefighters. So when I think of disparity, firefighter is not what immediately resonates with me. They're primarily male. They have a steady source of income. They certainly have access to the formal health care system, but they are developing cancer in excess numbers. About five years ago, I met Butch Smith. Butch Smith was a lieutenant in Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. He was a hulk of a man, six foot five, full of muscle, and wore a cloak of invincibility that made it very possible to visualize him running into the most harrowing of fire and coming out holding 10 children in each arm completely unscathed. At 42, Butch was diagnosed with multiple myeloma and given six months to live. But he wanted his life to represent more than the illness to which he would eventually succumb. So Butch started a very unpopular conversation about cancer in firefighters. This conversation wasn't unpopular because firefighters didn't know they developed cancer. It was unpopular because it raised attention to a weakness or a vulnerability that firefighters felt that if they readily admitted would influence their ability to stay strong, to stay macho, to be present. But Butch was undaunted. He rallied a group of other committed firefighters around him they reached out to Sylvester. I organized a team of multidisciplinary scientists, and together we started listening. Butch is no longer with us, but we stay true to the initiative that he inspired within our cancer center to understand this unique disparity and generate necessary solutions to address it. The work is very much in its infancy. Five years is not a long time in this scope of science. But we've made some really important discoveries. 
We've come to learn that firefighters are not just exposed to carcinogens when they're fighting a fire. In fact, their skin, their gear, the cab of the fire truck, they are all inundated with these contaminants. And the firefighters are exposed and re-exposed to them over the course of their heroic work. Worse, when they take their gear home to do laundry, they unintentionally expose their family to the same carcinogens. So we have put in place policies and practices around decontamination that's grounded in the principles of science. And this work is at the forefront of a national dialogue being spearheaded by the International Association of Firefighters about what we can do to keep our heroes safe. I um, have become stalwart in this belief that collaborative science is the best science. Many years ago, I showed up in Little Haiti, and women with limited formal education helped me understand why they experience an undue risk of developing and dying from cervical cancer, a preventable disease. Firefighters who were skeptical about science, unwilling to even mention the C word, walked me patiently through their day so that I could understand where they were being exposed to carcinogens and what we can do about it. This work is testament to this idea that we are so much stronger together. Today, we together can and will change the game on cancer disparities. Inspired by this possibility, an active institutional listening, Sylvester recently purchased this RV. This is literally a game changer. It is our physical commitment to being on the front lines of advocacy for prevention and health equity. This vehicle is going to be in four medically underserved communities every week. And on that vehicle, we are going to provide education and free screening. And guess what? We're going to be listening because the information that community members share with us will change the way that we do our science and will allow us to come up with inspiration about the possibility of what collectively we can accomplish in the space of prevention and also adherence to treatment. So, it is a privilege to tell this story. This is not just my story, this is our story. It's Larry's story, it's Butch's story, it's actually your story. It's the idea that when we harness our collective intellect and inspiration, that we have the possibility to be the change that we hope to inspire. And for Sylvester, this is our commitment to do exactly what our community has been asking us to do, to get out of our offices and labs and to be in the community, to make a formal commitment to, pre to prevention. And most importantly, not just to do science that simply describes disparity, but makes the real inroads to changing it. Thank you.